have the privilege of being able to open up God's Word with, with us today. I'm going to use one of those, those stands. I'm kind of a, I'm sort of a book note guy. Keep, keep those close. Let me bust this out over here. Is that all right? Yeah. Cool? Is that cool? Thank you, worship team, for leading us towards the, the heart of Christ. Appreciate that. I, um, you know, I used to do announcements, and now it's kind of back. I'm back. It's good to be back. Ryan's rocking the announcements, but I, you know, today I guess I can come back, and I, was, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here. More than you know, yesterday uh, evening on the way to Costco, uh, car dro- Costco, yes, give it up for Costco. <laughs> come on. Had the girls in my little car. car another car pulled out, didn't miss the stop sign, avoided it. Uh, swerved, ran up on the curb, crashed into a stop sign, and totaled, more or less totaled our car. Fortunately, my girls and I weren't seriously injured. I'm a little sore, but nothing too serious. But boy, you become aware of how quickly life could change, right? As, as, as ordinary as going on a run to Costco, suddenly it's like we could have all either been seriously hurt or died. And you realize we, we have just a day. Every day is a gift. Uh, then God obviously must want me to be here this morning, I guess. So, uh, and so, but can I, can I, I just ask you something? If you, if you need to tell someone that you love them, could you do that today? Could you do, just take, make a, either send a text or someone that needs to hear, I love you. We say we praise Jesus, but we also, we love God and we love others, right? Could you just think, think of someone that needs to hear that? If we have a leg, if this is your last day or my last day, may that be our legacy, that we have we have loved, okay? Would you just would you mind doing something like that? Okay, just think of that one person that needs to hear "I love you." Um, uh, so I just could you do that? Um, so, okay, good. Love, uh, love you too, Lori. Gosh, there's so much love I've received in this church. I cannot thank you too. Wow, okay, I'm cutting you off at two. That's it. I can't take any more. I'm gonna cry. So. Okay, um, I'm also going to steal one of uh, a, a verse because Scott's going through First John. So I just went in and grabbed a verse right out of there. He said I could teach him whatever I want, he, but I don't think he meant like my book, you know. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I went right for it. So we're going to go uh, open up our Bibles uh, to uh, the mic drop of First John, uh, the last book, uh, the last verse of the of First John, chapter five, verse twenty-one. Could someone read that? The first century mic drop? Could someone actually stand and read that? First John chapter 5, verse 21, last verse of the book. Boom. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. May your love flow through us to those who need to hear it, who need to experience it. Lord, we want to be, to open our hearts to your word this morning, that we can be, that it can pierce us and make us more like Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. For a number of years I was uh, involved in global missions, and I traveled extensively, and I was able to do some really exciting things that in my single days were just the coolest things I could have ever imagined. I wasn't always happy at the time because I wanted to be married, but God allowed me the opportunity to do a lot of travel, see some really cool things. One time I was on a, a missions trip with, uh, with a church and uh, the, the leader of the, of the team, and um, we had the opportunity to in, in India to baptize some, bl- some brand new believers. So we went out. Uh, this was in rural India. It's not like you have these nice baptismals or things like that. It's <laughs> there isn't a baptismal, that right, sort of thing. It's like you find a body of water, and oftentimes it isn't always the nicest body of water. You know, it's not like a public pool or something, you know. This was just whatever you get. And so it was kind of a muddy little, I don't know, aqueduct or something, some kind of like little watering hole, whatever. And there's probably some water buffalo around there and everything, which is actually very true. And so these are very simple people, but they're coming to Christ, and they're wanting to be baptized. And so I had asked the elder from our church to, uh, to do the, perform the baptisms, and so I was just able just to kind of watch it happen. And there was something that in the middle, and with everything was focused out in the water, and there was this guy getting ready to be baptized over on the side of, 
of the of the water, and I was kind of just for some reason I was just watching him. And before he got into the water, I noticed him. He took this necklace and he threw it to the ground. And I and I didn't know I didn't really know what that meant, but I knew it meant a lot. And I knew I wanted to, sp- and so I asked about it. What what did he do? And what was that about? And uh, Caleb, who was uh, uh, the director of the ministry there in India, he goes, well, actually, that's a charm necklace. That represents the power his God gave him. And that was, uh, and he was throwing that aside because he was now going into the waters of baptism to be a new creation. So before he got baptized, he did something really, really important. He threw out his idols. He had had an idol that was so obvious in his life, and he threw it out before he got baptized. What amazing symbolism that is. And it stuck with me. It's like, whoa, what if we did that? That guy probably had a third grade education, but I guess he's smarter than many theologians, many of us who've been raised in the church, because I think he understood something really, really important, that idolatry has no place in our hearts. I think we kind of let things like idolatry is kind of an India thing, right? We think it's, it belongs over there. They have the idols, and boy, do they. I tell you, they're everywhere you go. Uh, but I'll tell you something. All cultures have idols. And we in America have just as many idols as in India. Uh, we have them. Idols aren't just out there. They are in us. We have just the same idol-making factory, as John Calvin called it. Our hearts are idol-making factories. We manufacture them and we form them to suit us and to please us. Idols exist in America. They exist in the American church. And they exist in us. And we actually are masters of not seeing them. And so hopefully this time, this time we're, I want to put the lens on ourselves this morning and not on anyone else. I'm not here to condemn the church. I'm not here in America. I want us to examine ourselves, me included. What are the idols in my heart? And is this preventing me from being the all that God wants me to be? So what is an idol? An idol is, the next first slide, an idol is anything that takes the place that God deserves in our heart. Even good things can become idols. Because when we put something good in the wrong place, it becomes an idol. When something that's good becomes ultimate, it becomes an idol. When we say, we we proclaim Christ alone is our salvation, but often we say Christ and... Christ and this particular thing, this particular thing, this American dream, that particular goal, this particular thing, in order to fulfill us and to fill our hearts. God will even withhold a good thing, good things that we pray for and desire, if he knows it will become an idol. I'll give you a quick example. I was in my, I mentioned my single days. I, I really wanted to be married. And being married is a good thing, right? Wouldn't we say that's a pretty good biblical goal? And I, I prayed for a long time, 10 years every day, for the right person. And I couldn't figure out why God wouldn't want to answer that prayer. And I could, it's like, Lord, this is a good thing. I, ministry would be so much better. I'd have some respect in the church. Or I'd be, I just didn't want to be, honestly, I didn't want to be lusting all the time. I wanted to be married. I, you know, just, just keep it real, right? Uh, I just didn't, I wanted to be married. And I was lo- lonely on these travels oftentimes. And so those aren't bad things things right not being lonely not being lusting not not you know wanting to be a family and all that that's all good but god want he- withheld this good thing because he didn't want it to become the ultimate thing he wanted it to have its right place and it wasn't until i didn't it took me a long time to figure this out but it wasn't until i let go and said i don't have to have this i don't have to be married to be complete in order to be that God actually provided that. Then t- that's when God provided that, the, the right woman for me. And woke me up at 2 in the morning in Chicago, was staying with, with my aunt, and I knew Melissa was the one for me. So, uh, so that is an, an idol is anything that takes the place of God in, uh, that God deserves in our heart. So that's an idol. 
But why are idols so bad? And I think we can kind of deduce it, but let's just ask that question. Why are idols so bad? Turn to the Ten Commandments uh, in Exodus um, chapter 20, verses 3 through 6. Ten Commandments. I was, that's one of those, for some reason, I always, I, I, I learn to memorize right where it is. I'm bad at, like, where things are located in the Bible. Scott is a genius at that. I am, like, second grade on that type of stuff. I'm just really, really bad. So I have to, like, do concordances and look up stuff. But uh, Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 through 6. And I should have marked it. I was legit. Okay. Ten Commandments, number one, right? We put these Ten Commandments. We say this is a, a, the bedrock of society. And so you would guess that one and two would be pretty important, right? Actually, there are, I don't think there are actually many laws that, in, uh, that talk about one and two in terms of m- in modern Western society, right? But, but interesting. But these are actually the first and second most important laws in the Ten Commandments. Um, number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Number two, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. And s- you shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I am the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. So I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. Oh, okay, well, you know, why not? One more great verse but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So this idolatry, what, this idol, takes a place, takes up place in your heart that God deserves. And so the very fact that an idol can exist in our hearts becomes an affront to God. This is offensive to the very nature of God, because simply he is no longer God to us when we hold an idol. Right? It's an affront to him. It's like he's jealous. He belongs to this is where he deserves to be. And if we put anything else in there, he is now, has, it's an affront to him. It's offensive. It, it goes against his nature. Idols are bad because it is an affront to his very, his very nature. Secondly, idols are bad because it destroys parts of ourselves and who God wants us to be. It hurts us when we cling on to idols when we cling on to something that doesn't belong there, when it should be God and we cling on to something else. It destroys all our obedience, our our selves, our hearts, the way its affections, our desires. It it can destroy and corrupt all these things that God wants us to be because we we start to, to, to cherish the wrong things. And then thirdly, idols are bad because they harm those around us. When we make anything other than the love of God and the love of neighbor, any, when we, anything else, when we start to love things rather than love people, we then are now going to be hurting people, right? We're going to use people, right, to get our idols or to fulfill those idols in our heart. We're going to manipulate them. We're going to sell things that they don't need or we're going to tell them things so they could do things for us. So we're going to lie and cheat and steal anything in order to... Uh, Make us so we feel our idols. Or we're going to judge people. We're going to exclude people ra- by, but because their view of, their, of our idol. Imagine if we said that this pastor had a moral failing, right? What do you assume that is, right? What do we assume? Assume someone affair, right? We say that's bad. And it should, you know, that's a moral failing, clearly. But what if it's that pastor had an idolatry? <laughs> or, the, or that Christian, oh, yeah, they, they, they held, I, they're, they're full embrace in idolatry. Their heart is so towards something else. It should be. It's the number one and two commandments. Idolatry in the heart should not be should bother us. It's not just a little thing. It's a big, big deal. It's fundamental in our relationship to God, ourselves, and to other people. Idols have no place in our hearts. And for, and I'm and I'm going to say this right now. I have idolatry. There's idolatry. I know that I'm I work wor- and and so I'm in this with uh, I'm in this with you. That I, sh- I we're in the same struggle. And so our t- our, and the goal today is just to kind of examine that and reflect and say what we can do to deal with the idolatry in our hearts. So I don't come as you as some, some guy who has it all figured out. Believe me, I'm, I'm, in, this, I'm in the trenches with you, okay? So that, that's what I, why idols are so bad. Second, second question, why do we make idols? If God is God, 
and he provides boundless love and purpose and truth, why do we so often make idols in our hearts? And I mentioned again, we our hearts, as Calvin said, our hearts are idol factories. We have this propensity in our hearts to still want something other than God, something else to fulfill us, to satisfy us. And that's just, that's just the, our basic disposition. So knowing that, we have to be ready that this is where our, our idol factory is, that we're, and it comes from us. But I want to go on, uh, on another level with us. Uh, oftentimes, we'll all have different ways that we're, we have idols, right? We're, some of us have different kinds of idols. Um, and I want us to explore this idea of the wound. The wound is something in our lives, in our past, uh, that has hurt us, that is fundamentally, not just a little thing, but it's something that has really scarred and shaped us to where we have been hurt deeply and fundamentally. Every one of us in some way has a wound. A lot of times it's in childhood. It can come from our parents. It can become, it can become a thing that was said to us or said over and over to us said that you're worthless or said that you're an idiot or whatever it is or said that you or you just feel you're totally unloved and that wound can become the breeding ground of idolatry the wound is the can be the place where we are going to look for something else to heal that wound and uh it could be it could be it could be our culture it could be some other event it could be like i was just i was given i had this disease or whatever when i was a kid and i missed out on playing with my friends and and so they live their life filling up wanting to play the rest of their life it's that wound right have you ever met people who've gone through the great depression there was a lot of people who came out of the great depression yeah sure they made it through but a lot of them experienced a deep wound of not having stuff. And so how do they, how did that generation oftentimes come out of the Great Depression? Stuff, get stuff, right? Get more things. And, and, a lot, and to fill that wound, they often became workaholics. And, pr- and they showed their love by providing for people. I love you, well, <laughs> you have a home. They thought that was the love language, right? Of people who went through that wound. And so those are those, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about, is that we all have some wound where we've been hurt, and that is an area where idolatry can foster in our hearts. You, you tracking with me? Okay, sometimes I like that African-American style where you can say amen, and so <laughs> I, I like that. I, I did that. I have preached in African-American church, so I, I, I'm kind of, kind of jealous. But I want to make sure you're tracking with That's all I really care about. Um, and I think we need to acknowledge that. We need to say, what is the wound that has happened to me? And what am I trying, what idol am I doing to try to fill that? Okay? So it could be the father wound. That's a big one. Or the, the parent wound. It's that deep, deep thing that hurt us. And we will fill that, fill it with whatever we can. We go to church, we read our Bibles, but there's just that wound and it just still doesn't go away. And that's the breeding ground of idolatry. So, and we need to look for that. And I don't, you have to answer that question. You need to go there, go to that place and say, what is it? And that might help us understand why we have these perpetual sins in our lives, why we have this idolatry in our lives. So another, qu- the next question, how do I know when something becomes an idol? That's a good question because we can love uh, the, the things I'm going to mention that are big I- idolatry in America actually are most o- overwhelmingly pretty good things. But when does something become an idol? Uh, s- because God is extremely, wants to deal with your idols. And I think breaking through those idols is going to help you and, f- and, and make you, your life, it'll change your life. You're going to be yielding yourself to the Lord and you're going to see him work in you in new and powerful ways when we say what it is and, and can say what it is what is, is holding the place of idolatry in our hearts. And as I said again, idols are incredibly hard to self-identify, especially when a group of people have the same idols. Because we look around and say, well, they, they're doing it, right? Or th- that good Christian is doing that, right? They're whatever. And there's a big danger in justifying our position based on the fact that someone else is doing it, even if they seem like good 
this is between you and God. Is this an idol in you? So I don't care what great Christian you could name who seemingly has that position. doesn't really matter. I want you to examine yourself. You're not to go and point out your, the idol of your spouse, by the way. <laughs> it's not good. You're, that's an instant track to an argument that won't go well. They're free, <laughs> free advice, no charge for that. It won't go well. Uh, point, the point is to examine your own idols. So here's, I, I have a little check, so four checks, heart checks, okay? This is to examine if, if you have an idol in your heart. And I, I want, I, I don't usually tell people to write things down, but if you get, learn these checks, if you will. The first is the emotional check. Okay, the, the next point, I think, did I? Okay, emotional check. And the emotional check is like you're going to a car, you know, a car repair, you, you do your checks, check all the things, right? Check yourself. Is this thing my greatest passion? Wh- how do, what does it stir up in me? And by passion, I mean a few things. It could be excitement. It could be, you, you get so excited. I knew a guy uh, who was, was so um, very level-headed, very reasonable, and um, all great, great theology. Loved the guy. Loved, he loved the Lord. But he was level-headed at church, but he screamed and hollered at, football, at his football games. Seriously, yeah, he did. And sure enough, 20 years later, his son doesn't go to church, but they do share the love of football together because kids often follow you in your passions. They see what, they don't care what you say. They see what you're excited about. Your passions are a good indicator of what has become an idol to you. Now, there's nothing wrong with cheering at a football game. Or, or whatever it is. I'm not, I'm not here to condemn stuff like that. I'm saying the, our heart towards something. So examine your excitement over it. Now examine not just passion, not just cheering and excitement, but all, what about anger? What's pissed you off this week? Can I, can I say that, Scott? I guess so. Okay, can I say pissed off? Okay. Tame, that's tame. Compared to Scott, that's actually pretty tame, right? Right. I, I can't even mention his own nicknames. On t- <laughs> I won't even dare the ones that he's said. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Lori just tried to stop me, too, from not mentioning his husband's nicknames. Um, <laughs> what's made you angry? What's, what, what has been a, do you have a lot of conflict with people? If conflict follows you around certain topics, maybe there's some idolatry there. Think about it. Are you angry a lot? What is it? What is, if conflict follows you around... Are you always get, getting into talks about politics? Are you f- dropping truth bombs on the Internet and letting people know what to think and how stupid they are? <laughs> maybe, well maybe there's an, some idolatry there. We should be peacemakers. And if conflict follows us around certain topics, whether it's money, politics, social issues, whatever it is, if that's what, if that is, if conflict is around us, then maybe there's some anger issues with us. Or maybe just simply... It's not what related to other people, just simply we're, we're all angry about things. We're always upset. It's amazing how angry America is for having the wealthiest, one of the he- healthiest, wealthiest societies in history, yet we're so angry. Anger is a big issue in our culture, isn't it? Why is it? I think anger, we're, we're so angry because we're so idolatrous. Throw that out there. We're so angry because we're so idolatrous. Think, think about that one. Think about that one. Is that twi- did, I hear th- did I hear tweetable? Okay, I'm, I could dr- I'm, I could go now. I'd be happy. <laughs> Once you read the tweet level, which sadly isn't much. <laughs> so first check, emotional check. Uh, second one, identity check. Oops, I whacked my mic there. Uh, identity check, not identity theft. Identity check. Do I see myself complete without it? If we're using the term "you complete me." then that, per- that thing or person or concept is uh, an idol. And we, c- we so attach ourselves to things, and I'm going to give more examples later on, but uh, we so are t- attach ourselves to this idol that it becomes indistinguishable with who we are. And frankly, the American church has, be- has so much idolatry in it that people can't separate what is idolatry and what is Jesus. Because they look at us, because we become so attached to some things, whatever. And and I don't even want to go into the list right now. I won't even. I don't have time for that. 
we were in this discussion. I was uh, 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 I lived uh, as a missionary for two years in Siberia, of all places, Los Angeles, uh, Phoenix, Siberia. It was a natural. <laughs> that's a natural life progression. Think think about that. Uh, so we were discussion because wi without we didn't have television, so we just talked a lot. So. Um, so uh, without, so we're discussing like, would we give up our U.S. passport if in order to love and give the gospel to Russian to Russian people? Now there was the, the reason it happened. There was I get some nuclear plant that it was overheating, and they were talking about shutting it down. And was this going to be the next Chernobyl? And should we evacuate? And so should we identify ourselves as Americans getting out of there because we don't want to get hurt, or we're going to stand with the people who d who can't get out of there? And share the gospel with them. So we had this discussion as a team. Should, what would we do? And so then we said, would we give up our passport in order to, to, to share the gospel? And not be an American? Give that up? I'm an American. And I'm American. I, I, I think I use that little accent. I think, is that true? Would I give it up? Or is, it, is that, had that become something, the wrong place? My, could I separate myself as a follower of Christ apart from my country? That's a question. That's a question. What, but that, what is it? Check your identity. Is it, it, are we able to separate ourselves from anything? We, we define ourselves, oh, yeah, I'm a dog person. Or I'm a Target, I'm a target gal. <laughs> you know, I, don't, I don't do Walmart, you know. It's like we define ourselves by the things we like, right? It's funny, but we, we had, what's that, a Costco person? We had some Costco. <laughs> no judgment. Almost died getting there, but no judgment. <laughs> so we can define ourselves by the stuff we like. Or the things that we do, oh, I'm, a, I'm not that kind of person. And we, as if we can get out of anything if we just say, well, there's not that kind of person, right? The identity check. But check your identity. And if it becomes a part of who you are, it's become an idol. We, we, we are Christ alone. We are his, we are the child of God, first and foremost, full stop. Second, the third, second identity check. Third question, obedience check, check it. Does this idol loving, this idol, prevent me from doing anything God wants me to do? When, you, when your heart embraces an idol, it will prevent you from doing something or, the, that you sh or prevent you from doing what you should do or cause you to do something you don't want to do. Okay? We know who Harvey Weinstein is now this week, don't we, right? Isn't that horrible? Nothing new there under the sun, right? Power corrupting uh, people. Idolatry on both sides. Especially, we should especially be worried about power. Power is corrupting, and it can it can crush the weak. The Bible says a ton about that. We won't, and I could do a whole sermon just on that. But on both sides, we see idolatry, whether it's the idol of sex or it's the idol of of status or or power, reaching some career. I want to be an actress. That's what it's going to take, or an actor, whatever. Uh, with no gender, I mean no gender on that one. Anything. Whatever it is to take to get to be, to, to achieve my dreams, I'm going to have to do something that is morally wrong and goes against what I believe. Absolutely not. There's no place for it. Actually, the gal, the gal who basically caused the accident yesterday actually denied to the policeman that she had any fault. She's an Uber driver, and she was afraid she'd, get, she'd lose her job, right? So she would rather lie under oath to a police officer rather than admit the truth, Right? Idolatry, idolatry, right there. So, behind the sins, there's so often idolatry. When something becomes an idol, we'll do bad things in order to possess it or keep it. In fact, I've heard it said that you list out all ten commandments. If you get the first two right, you won't wor worry about the last eight. If you don't, if you if you put God and Him first, above all. You're not gonna. You're not gonna covet. You're not gonna tell, bear false witness. You're not gonna steal. All the all all ten. And before we condemn those people, are we any better? Are we? Do we do we ever disobey, or not do what God wants us to do because of some I idolatry? Do we buy things we can't afford? Do we ignore our families because we really need to work really hard to get that promotion? Do we have friends? Do we, a lot of men don't have friends. Give up on a friendship. What about church? Are we, do we, are we involved in our church? It used to be that regular church attendance was three times a week. Three times a month is pretty good these days. I think that's pretty good. 
but we're, we're not, we're, we disconnect from that. Well, there's other reasons. I don't want to make a big judgment on that, like how counting church attendance. But sometimes we ignore things that are really important because of idolatry. So check your, check your obedience. And if you're seeing patterns of disobedience, go back and check your idols. Fourth, filter check. Check your filters, not just your oil filter. And apparently there's like, there's all kinds of filters in the car. And I know virtually nothing about cars. So I could give great analogies, but I'm pretty ignorant. So uh, I can drive them. Uh, I enjoy them. Uh, so check your filters. Does this filter define my relationships? Do I create us and them as the result of my filter? Because idols love breaking people up into groups. And the love of idols divides us. Are we surrounded by like-minded people who love the same idols that we do? Or I should say like-idled people. And because when that's the case, uh, we, uh, we, we judge everybody on the basis of their idols. So check your filters. I think a lot of our segregation in our society is related to idolatry. It goes back to what we really value. Th that person won't benefit what I want to become, my idolatry. So we uh, disassociate with them. There's a huge divide between rich and poor in our country, um, educated and not educated, people who don't understand each other. I think a lot of it has to do with idolatry. Think, think on that one also for a while. So now we're going to get specific. And this is the dangerous part because... If you, if you, uh, you might not like me as a result of this, and I have to be careful because I actually am a little nervous sharing this because I might say some things that maybe are an idol. I'm not saying that they are. I'm saying maybe they are an idol in your heart. And I found these things in my observations to be fairly common in our culture among our people. So these are things also including that could be an idol in me. Okay? So I'm this we're, I hope I come to you as an equal, not as a judge, right? So I want to look at some things, so which could become idols. Okay, anyone know who this is? Ganesh, right. And who's Ganesh? Good, excellent. Ganesh, Hindu god, the god of success, prosperity. You put a statue of, in India, if you put a statue of Ganesh in your business, um, you are, you're saying, I want prosperity to reign in my business. Interesting, huh? Because we don't have an idol of success, do we, in our culture? It's, we sure do. We have a huge problem with idolatry, the idolatry of success in our culture. And we judge people by whether they're successful or not. How big's your church? Oh, that's successful. That's 5,000 people. It must be successful. You're somebody I want to listen to. Oh, it's only 50? I don't know about that. How much, well, that's a nice house. Whatever it is, that's a nice education. Well, those are cool. You dress well. Oh, you look, you, look, you, look, you look put together. All those are things can be levels of success. And after a while, you realize, if you were to see this, like a statue of, 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 of Ganesh sitting here in the coffee shop, it would probably make you uncomfortable, right? And I'm literally putting this up here for a reason. Because I want the idol of success to make us uncomfortable. I want to challenge that maybe we, help, we have this in our hearts more than we think. I think we t so often tend to judge people on their level of success, and we end up crushing the people that God wants us to serve. James 2, 1 through 5. Gonna, I don't wanna, uh, why don't we read that? I think it's too important on this. Can someone read that for me? I'm just going to have a sip of water. Cause so James chapter, and stand and read if you don't mind. James chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Uh, James, James chapter 2. Okay. <laughs>
Yeah, one, verse 5. Partiality comes out of idolatry, the idol of success. When we value people who are rich, value people who are successful. So that means if Brad Pitt walked in here and said, I want to follow Jesus, we sure would be talking about it, wouldn't we? Chances are a Christian, a Christian radio station or media station would love to get an interview if they found out that Brad Pitt became a Christian. And it would just be great news, right? That's success, right? A big, big famous person. But if a homeless person came in, walked in, who do we show partiality to? Are, are we any different? Or do we value people on, b- by our idol of success? So it's such a dangerous thing, but when we judge and separate people by that, and so we, we become dis- the, the wrong kind of discerners, the exact opposite of who Jesus wanted us to be. Jesus was a friend of losers. And I hope you're a friend of losers too. Times in my life where I sure felt like a loser. I don't know. And so, and so I think we should just know, hey, I'm in there with you. I'm, we're all in this together. We, should ev- we can love and serve everybody. But the idol's success not only separates us, it also can drive us to do the wrong things. We can overwork to move up the ladder of success and deny our family and deny our, wor- deny our friendships and community. And so in our culture, if, you're, if you say you're addicted to your work, get a promotion, right? If you're addicted, if you're addicted to drugs or so if you whatever, you'll probably get fired. But in our culture, we love success, right? We love winners. But you can be crushing everyone else around you in the, in that drive. Men especially can be prone to this. Can define themselves by their success. We 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 we're providers, right? So if you ever met a man who's been uh, been fired, or un- or is unemployed for long periods of time, he's taking a big wound because we uh, so often. This becomes a part of who we are. And I've often told women who are, whose husbands are struggling with depression, I said, you know, a man, w- because they're unemployed or something, I said, you know, him being unemployed is just like you having a miscarriage. Because it's so fundamental to who that person is. So that, that could be a whole other talk as well. But uh, I struggled at different times when, when things didn't work out and I, got, I wasn't able to provide or I didn't feel successful. I, I remember I, when I got my master's degree, I felt really excited. I was, I was successful. I've got a good degree from a nice, fancy school and came back, and I was unemployed for a year. And that was really, really hard. And, I had to, and it was another example of God showing me that work or my education would never be my measure of success. It was Christ alone, and he would still, he loved me. He would, he would use me in his time. But it was, an, uh, it was a breaking down of an idol, idolatry in me. Okay. Next, next idol. All right. Okay, here we go. Yes, you get to see naked people at bit Sozo. So, um, so the first is on the left is, uh, can you handle this? Can you, are you all right? Can we, can, we, can we talk? Okay. The first we have on the left, we have two, two different idols, uh, two different idolatry on, on different sides of the coin. On the left we have, yes, it's Adonis and Venus, right? Uh, the, this, and and the, on the right we have Bacchus. Bacchus, okay? That is, it's a, it's a dude. Uh, uh, uh <laughs> Just so you know, yeah. It's by the artist Ruben, for any uh, Renaissance painter. He was, he, he loved, he loved, you know. Anyway. Um, bodies. Bodies can become idolatry, okay? Bo- worshiping and putting our, a place of, of, of the wrong place in our hearts towards our view of our bodies and the bodies of other people. And then there's two sides to the coin. On the left, we have the perfect body, the perfect man and woman body, and they're in love. It's so perfect, right? And we, v- we create this grid of viewing the world and judging other people based on their bodies. We look at them and we say, oh, they're fat. Oh, they're, they're obsessed with working out. Oh, they're, uh, that's an idol. You know, we just ju- everyone gets judged. We are, we are an incredibly visually oriented pe- uh, society more so than ever. We, don't just, we have imagery almost every second of the day in front of us in one way or the other, and it creates this way in which we judge people based on our bodies. And then we judge ourselves. Constant self-condemnation of our bodies and, we ju- and, and uh, 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 almost self-hatred. And it comes out in our speech and in our attitudes and what we do. Incredible 
it's America's crazy. We're crazy about bodies and both good and bad. We have the most Olympic gold medals and the highest obesity. So we've got a weird way of looking about bodies, right? So we can be obsessed with perfection and judge everybody, or we can be obsessed with bo- like Bacchus and indulge every, every part of our body. And so we, d- we meet every need. Every meal becomes a feast. Every desire becomes met. And I find it interesting that I, I almost never hear the church talk about fasting. Isn't it interesting? We're silent on fasting, but we yet we scream feasting. Huh? I wonder. Maybe we have some idolatry there. So we have to be careful. We have to be careful. Gluttony used to be considered a sin. I mean, no one talks about it. I've been to probably 200 churches. I've never heard anyone talk about gluttony. But it is. It's there. It's, it's in the Bible. In fact, in the, four, in the 17th century, it was considered one of the deadliest sins because it showed that you're most satisfied with the world. So we have to be careful. We have to know that this... Idolatry on either side, whether you're obsessed with it, perfection, or you just give up and just meet whatever you do, whatever you want. It's the same. It's this. It's two sides of the same coin. Philippians three nineteen says, "Their end is destruction. Their god is their belly, and their glory is their shame." The idolatry of the desires of our flesh can just be that case. There's a whole topic there. Someone could t- talk about that for another time as well. But we need to examine the idolatry of our bodies. I need. I'm probably running out of time. How are we doing on time? I'm doing okay. Okay, cool. We make them make our way. So next one. All right. So I'm having this down. Sports and entertainment. Okay. Idolatry. These guys are excited, man. They're pumped up for their team. Go team. Whatever that. I guess it's Seahawks, right? Everyone probably knew the Boo Seahawks. I don't know. I don't care. I don't. Whatever. So sports and entertainment. We are an incredibly Sports and entertainment obsessed culture. The enjoyment of these things, I, I'm not here to proclaim judgment. There's great enjoyment in all of these things. But what is it about when it becomes idolatry? But sports and entertainment is huge. We have sports teams for all the sports, it's nonstop, and then you think all the professional leagues. Then you have all the college teams, and then you have your kids' teams. It's just nonstop for sports, right? Then there's fantasy sports. Sports that don't even exist, but it's hypothetical based on certain statistics. And people are really, really into that. There's fantasy sports. And then there, now there's eSports. You know what eSports is? If you don't, video games, that's, that's, that's getting bigger. It's becoming a big industry. So no, I don't just have to sit on the couch and watch someone else throw a football. I can now watch them lead their, their, their league or whatever against like, another League of Legends and fight each other play characters, whatever. I mean, watch video. People play really, uh, who are really good at playing video games. You have eSports. And then you have, uh, then you have movies and television and uh, videos. YouTube is, is bigger than ever, more and more. Uh, music, video games. And, we, and our culture says we're too busy. Okay, next, next slide real quick. Netflix streaming hours per subscriber. So 2011, 300 hours per subscriber, and then getting close to 600 in 2015, and I let me guess it's trending up still, I'm ver- very likely. Now, uh, granted, that might be a little extreme because I think that's per account, and there might be multiple families, but nevertheless, those are a, a, a massive amount of hours. And again, there's nothing wrong with movies, sports, and entertainment. I'm not here to, at, at all to judge. I'm, I'm asking us to think about when these things are idolatrous. If, they're, if you're passionate more about uh, your sports team, if you're checking sports scores in church, I've seen that happen. <laughs> I have. Uh, if you're checking some kind of entertainment, whatever it is, it happens. I've, uh, whatever it is, if your passions are in the wrong place, and if that excites you more than the, uh, than s- the salvation of Jesus Christ in your life and his, ch- his work of the kingdom in your life, then maybe we need to do a heart check. When, I'm, when I'll sit in line for hours and hours for some new movie that comes out, and I won't. I, I'm in a real hurry to get in and out of church. Maybe there's something. There's some idolatry in here. And so th- again, another topic that would be a lot to talk about. But examine our hearts to make sure. Okay. Now the next one. Oh no. Who are those people? Not Chip and Joanna. <laughs> not, not okay. Fixer up. Yes, the fixer upper celebrity couple that all Christians seem to love and adore in America. Chip and Joanna Grace. Now, sh- and, and, and I'm going to show something here. There's two things going on in this picture. 
One, this fa- people love this show for two reasons. One, they love this family. Better than most shows, you just like these people. And I like this show. I binge-watched the first season when it was on Netflix, and they don't, for some reason, they didn't keep adding seasons. But love the show. But there was something that was really attractive about this seemingly great family that always seemed to do something together. The kids were there. It just seemed this perfect, perfect family. And then you look around and go, ooh, that's a nice kitchen too, right? You like that? And in we actually have two idols right in one picture. The perfect family and the perfect home. And this can become such a deep idolatry in a culture that we might not even see it. There's, we strive to the perfect family. And in that case, we, we push and push and push to a family God just didn't give us. And we're so judgmental of people who don't measure up. Uh, we have so many. We, broken, broken families are a huge problem in our culture. And obviously we need to emphasize the, the healing and res- restoration of families. But there are also an incredibly amount of godly people who are used by the Lord in the scriptures who came from broken families. Attempted murder. Well, yeah, m- or I threw, threw my brother into slavery. Kind of some big, there's, some, some, there's some big issues that went on uh, by God, the, among godly people. There aren't a lot of perfect families in scripture. And so let's be careful that we don't hold up a, a model of being used by God that was never used, in, that he himself doesn't even hold. Okay? And then we s- loneliness is a big issue in our culture. We segregate and we separate married and singles, and I think we need to bring people back together. Half of America isn't, isn't married. Half of the adult population. And if we separate, we say the only, good, only thing that's Christian is a good, healthy family, then I think we're doing a huge disservice. I remember feeling excluded in my single days for like a decade because I wasn't married. It's like I just wasn't invited to the table because I was single. And we have to be really, really, really careful. The second part of that is the perfect home. And there's this incredible dissatisfaction that when we watch these shows or we watch, we see the things, the remodels and all that. And, and again, it's nothing wrong with fixing up your home. There's a place for all of that. And I, I, I hope there's to do a lot. I mean, we've done that and I hope to do more. But there's the danger is we spend what we don't have. Uh, we, we're critical, we're, uns- we're dissatisfied all the time, we always wish something could be different, and we just aren't resting. We're just, we're just focused on having the nice and perfect home. Uh, tell, and, and, and it's so important, that's why God shakes things up sometimes. It's so interesting, in the last six weeks, it seems like there's been a natural disaster every week, doesn't it? There's been a hurricane, or fires, or flooding, or something really bad that's just been nonstop, and people are losing their homes. A year ago, my mom lost her home. I'm very aware of how ba- I, stro- I sorted through the rubble, looking through anything from our, our, my childhood and her, you know, our family, looking through that. I know how painful it is, but it's still just a home. It's just a place. And so we have to be careful that family and home don't become Id- Id- idolatry. And then finally, the last one. America itself, our country, our patriotism itself can become an idol. I know, I'm, keep, I'm keeping it real, right? Is this, is, is this us? I went, uh, what was it? This was 15 years ago, but I went to a Chris Tomlin concert. Written a lot of the worship songs in our modern church today. Good, g- great guy, so nothing wrong with that. But near the end of his concert, gets there, and there's sort of this, like, God and country. And he closes, and there's this big American flag at the end during the worship time. I thought, hmm, I wonder how that would play in Russia. I wonder how that would play in China. I wonder if he, if he, you know, there's 100 million Christians. There's actually more Christians in China than there are in America. I wonder if Chris Tomlin went there and put a big Chinese flag at the end of the, in the middle of worship. Would that be, would that seem good? God is a God of all nations. He's a God of all people. And when we put our country before the kingdom of God, we have created, our country has become an idol. My idol tis of thee. We put in our hearts. Politics becomes an idol. There's this guy named Michael Ware. I don't know if you know who he is. W e a r. I uh, he wrote a fairly. Uh, I don't even remember his title of his book, but he had a position where he actually worked for the Obama administration. Evangelical Christian. He was their faith liaison, representing the Obama administration to the faith community. And he was always taking a lot of heat because obviously he was in the Obama administration. But he said something that was really interesting to me. He goes. I mean, in, 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 he, I saw a quote uh, and him being interviewed, and he said something that really struck with me. Uh, he goes, 
I think politics has taken up a place in the hearts of America that it shouldn't have taken. And the reason we have so much conflict between left and right isn't simply that what we disagree. This isn't just about disagreement. This is battle. This is anger. This is those guys are evil. The other, the other people are really, really bad. It's true. Has, has our country taken the place in the hearts of us that it should never have taken? And I think that's the reason we are divided as a country is because of the idolatry of God's people. Whoa. That's a truth bomb right there. It's a truth bomb. And I think that when we celebrate the military more than our missionaries, when we send our kids off to die for America, and we don't really want to take any chances to, get to, to bring the gospel to the Middle East because it's dangerous, I have a problem with that. I met a, I met a gal... Uh, a gal, she was the, the, um, the dean of Bethlehem Bible College in the Gaza Strip in Bethlehem, an evangelical lady. And she goes, you know, uh, from New Jersey, of all things. And uh, she was like, I, I'm afraid to go to America. You know, I, she's training pastors to share the gospel in the Middle East in the Gaza Strip, but because America is so pro-Israel, is so pro-America, that we can't recognize our own brothers and sisters in Christ trying to share the gospel in Gaza. Because all we think about is the, those bad terrorists, those bad Muslims, and good Israel and good America. And we've created this polarity where we have broken the fellowship with our own brothers and sisters in Christ. That's, that is the definition of idolatry. We can't seek first the kingdom of God and seek America first in our hearts. Government can do America first. That's fine. Whatever. I want God's people to put the kingdom of God first. Jesus said it was his number one teaching was the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. Remember, God allowed even his own nation, the nation of Israel, to be taken over by the Babylonians, by the Egyptians, by the Assyrians, over and over again. Why? Because of their idolatry, right? You think God was uh, uh, Israel first? No, he's the hearts of God's people first. And he will allow bad things to happen to wake us up to the idolatry that we have. Finally, just some action points. Again, our job is not to point out, uh, yeah, here's the checks again. And make sure you get those down. Our job is not to point out the idols of other people. But do ask, uh, it's okay to ask someone, do you see this as becoming an idol in you? So feel free, uh, talk about this. Don't judge other people, but talk about it. Um, and it's okay to disagree with me on these five, whatever, it, but I just want us to examine our hearts and see, are these idolatry? And just two final concepts, the next, next slide. Two things that I think are helpful in this process. Uh, one is, is the Sabbath. I think we uh, practice the Sabbath. Don't work. Separate yourself from things that you normally do. That way, success and work won't become an idol. I think when we separate ourselves and commit ourselves to other th godly things, we're less likely to, uh, uh, we're, we're it bec we be then it makes us aware of what uh, something becomes an idol. And then fasting, uh, not and I'm using the fasting term broadly, not just uh, food, but let go of things for a while and see if they have an I uh, become an idol in your heart. I gave up music for a week. I was concerned it would become an idol in my heart. And I realized after it was a, a good discipline, and I realized it made life better, but I d it wasn't an idol, but I, have to, I do become aware of times where I just need to turn off the music and pray. It's not always going all the time. And we need to have it maybe, it's, maybe it's drowning out conversations, whatever it is. But practice the discipline of fasting, b b the Sabbath, and, feel, and confess this. Con let's let, let the Lord know this is an idolatry. I, want, I don't want this in my heart. Thank you all for, I know I went over. I just, uh, I'm obviously, I don't care at all about this topic, and I'm not passionate at all about it. But I really appreciate all of you taking the time to listen. Let me, let me pray for us. Father God, we commit our hearts to you. Lord, you know how we have set up different idols in our hearts. I pray that we do the hard work of examining where, we hurt, where, where our hurts are and what we seek to fill it in the wrong way. Lord, liberate us from the, the burden of, of the idols that we cherish and help us to break those idols down, to let them go and acknowledge that you alone belong in the center of our hearts. Thank you for this dear church family, and we love and, and cherish you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, John. Give it up for John.
great message. Two closing things I just want to leave you with. Number one, 